morning time, a peace, morning time, happy grand rising. You don't know, big up Father God to see another day. And big up my subscribers and uh, keep on subscribing to the Yardman Second Chance channel. You know, today's day two of the cartel trial, the appeal of England, Wagwan. But I watch it, you know, and I see like why the prosecutor them not prepare. They must struggle. Because it, the juror were messed up and them to kick him out, the judge, them other man say the judge should I just delete them jury there and get some new jury. See? But the prosecutor them the crown them I said boy Ray Ray and I talk about something like say the man them have the right to continue the trial with the tainted jury. So we're gonna jump in at it kinda of my opinion the prosecutor them under pressure. I'm to take a listen and comment for yourself. That the number of jurors is reduced. And um, my lord, overnight, um, my lady, overnight, um, Mr. Turnbull and I uh, dug up the entire Juries Act. Because in my submission, does need to see the structure. The most entire Juries Act is not very big. It goes back to 1892. But in my submission, when one looks at the structure of the Juries Act and what it is talking about, it is plain in very summary terms that there is a public duty on people to act as jurors. If you qualify, uh, to be a juror, then you must act as a juror, and it is only when you are discharged that you cease to be. There are certain requirements for qualification, such as, for instance, mental capacity and so forth. But my short point is once you're on that jury, you are one of their number until you are actually discharged. But I can deal with it quite briefly, and we sent it over this morning. Um, it goes back to, the Act goes back, I think, to 1892. If you look at, um, I'm not quite sure how, how, what number you're adopting, but if you look at as it were, the opening page of the Act, this Act may be cited as the Jury Act, you'll see um, it goes back to, uh, uh, it says, uh, 1962 at the top, and indeed, but that's the edition of laws, but you'll see under the heading, the Jury Act, 7th of July, 1898. Sorry, Mr. Knox, I have a problem, I can't open the file. Ah, oh, oh. okay. Oh. Yeah, well, if I remember, it's pretty much. This is a supplementary Jury Act. Yes. The one was sent this morning. Yes, yes. This morning. it would have been sent this morning, yes. I hope, of course, if it is translatable. Yeah, I'll try and talk to you. Just sent it by email. This is the share drive that I got. I sent you my email. It is all put on the email, I think. I've got it on the email. Yes, I've got it on the email. Thank you very much. Sorry. You'll see it's passed originally in 1898. This is essentially, I suspect, we haven't had time to do a full research. Essentially, in, in the Caribbean countries, there was often codification of the common law in the 19th century, and we rather suspect this goes back to uh, a sort of codification translated to Jamaica. Um, but you'll see, uh, first of all, section two, qualification of jurors. And you'll see there's a requirement in section 2.1 for any person of a certain um, age and so forth to be qualified and liable, and liable to serve on jurors. You'll see certain exceptions, one of which is in 2B, sub 2.2B, cannot speak, read, and write English. Um, and others, uh, D, for instance, you've been convicted of treason or another serious offence, then you're not qualified. And then subsection 5, save as provided by or pursuant to this section, but subject to section 18, no person qualified to serve shall be exempt from jury service. And then, sub, then section 6, no person whose name is on the jury list, I'll come to that in a moment, as a juror shall be entitled to be excused from attendance at court on the ground of any disqualification or exemption other than illness not claimed by him at the full final settlement of the list. But a judge, registrar of the Supreme Court and so forth may excuse any person if satisfied that the person is disqualified or entitled to exemption, uh, a hardship in case of employment, or such person um, for the reasons which would be sufficient to the judge and so forth should be excused. 
that's why I say this is essentially a public duty. Then section 7, you have uh, the provision as to how jury lists are made up. I don't propose to read that out, but there's a provision for making up of jury lists. Um, and section 8 gives further details as to how the jury list is to be uh, drawn up, uh, essentially by uh, the justices. And then section 10, it shall be lawful for the justices at such sessions to strike out of such list the names of all persons shown to their satisfaction to be not qualified or not liable to serve on juries or to be dead or disabled by mental capacity, deafness, blindness or other permanent infirmity. So these are the, this is the way, as it were, you are removed from the list. And then B, to add to such list the names of any other persons and then C, to correct errors. Uh, and then moving over to section 13, where the list has been settled, the justice will certify that the list is to the best of their knowledge a uh, true and proper list, and so forth. And that is the list which is to be used from which um, juries are subsequently selected. One then goes to, um, I think, provisions we already have, section 31. On trials on indictment for treason or murder, committed certain circumstances, and that's essentially capital murder, 12 jurors shall form the array on trials on indictment for the circuit uh, called other than for an offence in one, seven shall form the array, and then three. Could, uh, uh, forgive me. Can I just ask, is, is ours a murder falling within those either of those two categories? No, I don't think it is because it's, um, I think, um, just dropping down, it, it is in, um, but it's 44. Section 44, I have a feeling. Yes, well, in fact, it's with the future section 44, yes. it's asking the question. Yes, yes. <laughs> but we're, we're, in, we're in section 44. Um, would, would we have been in 31 1B but for the discharge of one juror? Or is it not a murder within? I, I, I don't, I have a feeling, I can double check this. Is it, in Jamaica, they've got a capital, they essentially have capital murder. Yes. So, to deliver a piece of the execution is duty. And for that, you need 12. That's you what that's like. Oh, so I see. You can't get 12 for that. But we're not in that category. So, 31, 12 jurors shall form the array. Um, and then at subsection three, when in the course of a criminal trial, any member of the jury dies or is discharged by the court through illness or other sufficient cause, the jury shall nevertheless, so long as, I must imagine I emphasize this, the number of its members is not reduced by more than one, be considered as remaining properly constituted for all the purposes of the trial. And the trial shall proceed under verdict may be given accordingly. And then subsection 4, where one juror has died or been discharged, the verdict of 11 jurors in a trial for treason or murder referred to in uh, 1B, or of six jurors otherwise, shall be deemed to be unanimous verdict. So that does and apply. so ours would be within the, within the ambit of the, the provision of our six jurors? Uh, I don't think we're down to six jurors, no. My Lord, I mean, well, well, we're not in the... Well, you, you just told us ours isn't a trial for treason or murder referred to in subsection 1B. Well, if I can just double check, that's my understanding. Certainly my understanding is, is that um, it, it, it may be, if I can double check this, um, it, it, it may be we are in fact in such a world, so that you can go down to 11. That certainly seems to be the assumption on which everyone proceeded. Well, well I don't know if they did, because when you get to 44, yes, um, you, I think the, the, the implication of 44 is that you need um, a unanimous verdict to convict of a murder falling within um, the, uh, the categories described yes. in um, 31, yes, uh, 31 1B. I mean, can I just, just take instructions from the behind the reason? What we are looking at here 
is if you look at section 31, it's an amendment made in 2015. Yep. That is why uh, there's confusion. I do apologize. But the proper 2010 Juries Act is already in the bundle. Um, in other words, what I produce today in this section is a 2015 amendment, which I think, well, I, uh, which would postdate the trial. Can, can you show us in the 2010 version? Yes, uh, that would be, I think, uh, in, I think I'm right in saying, um, volume one, I hope I'm right in saying volume one of the, um, yeah, we've got section 31, but we don't have section 44. It's, uh, it's, it's also got a it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, no, this, this, the version we've got in, uh, at, at bundle number 11 on, uh, is again the 2015, uh, as, as amended 2015. That's page uh, 6803. I do apologise. Um, I, I, I appreciate you don't bear sole responsibility for this, Mr. Knox, by any means, but it, it's quite important that we actually have the legislation that was in force at the time of the trial. My, my Lord, absolutely. Yeah. Um, my, my Lord, can I say one of the difficulties, this wasn't the point, of course, that was raised uh, in the uh, uh, in the post, uh, grounds and so forth, so it has been a bit of a rush, and I do apologise. It does well, not we, don't, we don't need to be rushed. Um, yeah. um, but it, it, but we can adjourn for uh, some minutes if that's going to give you time to get hold of a, a copy of the correct version of the, the jury act. Uh, in, as in force at that time. It's not always that easy from my experience. Um, one has to dig back a bit. But can, can I just say this for the purpose of the time being, the point I'm making, I'm assuming, as everyone has assumed, that the, uh, a jury of 11 was a sufficient number, but it couldn't go below. And that, and that appears to have been common ground throughout the trial, and indeed of course the bill is outstanding. So that's the premise. You can't go below 11. The point I'm on, in one sense, is not whether or not you can go below 11, but what is the nature of uh, a jury? And the nature of a jury, in my submission, is simply there are 11 members on it. And if there are 11 members on it, you've got a quorum. Even if, for some reason, uh, one or other of the juries is not, uh, is acting improperly, or there's reasons to place he's acting improperly, as long as he's on the jury, he is one of their number. And it's only when he's discharged that the jury number is reduced. That, that, that is the point I'm seeking to make, my lords. And I do accept, my lords, that obviously it would be important to uh, get the right version before you, my lords. If we could, well, I'm not sure we could do it, do it within a matter of minutes, yeah. experience, but if we could do it as soon as practical yeah. and, and get over to you the relevant uh, section, with, if appropriate, a very short note about what it comes to, uh, that, that, that might be a better way of dealing with it. But for the moment, my lords, I'm, I'm just making the point there was a quorum. And the reason I say that is because jury service is a public duty. You can't just get out of it. And once you are in the charge, if I can put it this way, of the jury, it's the jury who has to deal with you until the judge says, um, until the judge quit, discharges that particular juror. Thank you. Um, my Lord, I've just received a note saying the uh, Deputy DPP has sent the 2010 Act. Um, <laughs> um, I went to proceed it myself, but um, my, my Lord, perhaps I could just come back to that in a moment, but rather than yes, take time uh, um, trying to find it myself. Um, and uh, my Lord, yesterday one of the questions was put, well, what about mental illness? Now, one can see that if someone is, becomes mentally in, incapable in the course of the trial, let us say, 
on day seven. He is simply incapable. Well, my lords, in my submission, he is still strictly on the jury unless and until he is removed. But in circumstances like that, the judge in my submission would have no choice because that juror would be incapable, simply incapable of performing his oath. And there's a difference in my submission between the juror being incapable of performing his oath and the juror who is capable of performing it, but who is, for one reason or other, bent on uh, at not doing so. And in the latter case, I submit, he still counts, and the, uh, the judge is still entitled in principle to say, I'm going to carry on, and I'm not going to release you from your oath. So that's the first point I want to make on the quorum. The other point I was asked yesterday, could a court review a decision made by the jury after it has made it to find out whether or not it was in fact, uh, there was in fact, let us say, uh, a crooked juror on it, with a view then to that uh, conviction being set aside? And my, Lord, the, my lady, the answer to that is yes, and that's exactly it was the issue in the case called Merza, which is in the um, bundles at um, 7490, and that was a case where after the event, one of the jurors, the disgruntled juror who had wanted an acquittal, wrote, uh, I think, to the court or to the judge saying, I'm very unhappy about this, um, because I think the other jurors were racially motivated to um, produce conviction. And the matter went up to the Supreme Court. And of course, one question was whether, given the Contempt of Court Act, 1981 in the UK, uh, the court could actually investigate that allegation. They held that they could on the footing that the Contempt of Court Act wasn't intended uh, to prevent the court uh, from making such inquiries with a view to an appeal. Um, and uh, the common law position was, they held by implication, that of course the court can with a view to an appeal, can make uh, such an investigation if necessary. And on the facts of the case, the Supreme Court held, I think the House of Lords held, there was no need, uh, there, there, was, there was no requirement to look into the point. But we'll just pick the point up, it's at 7490, at Paris 9 to 10, that's where the case starts, at 7504. Secret, and they referred to Gregory, um, the ECHR case, which um, uh, accepted that. And then, moreover, there's a strong rebuttable presumption that the jury was impartial, uh, and that is how the matter was dealt with there. Uh, and um, they went on at the end, or rather, at your stay, given I think speech with Miss Alice Green at Power 32. We must, we must be a little bit careful with Lord Stain because he dissented. Ah, I have a feeling he may have dissented in the results. I'm not sure if he was dissenting in the... Yeah, no, I haven't read, read the, this, this for years, so I, I can't recollect, but uh, I'm just... So we need to be a little bit cautious. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm not sure he dissented on this point. Um, but but uh, if one looks at the head note, he does... Uh, he, he, he is, uh, as it were, um, agreeing that the um, court can look at the position after the event. And we'll get to that from the headline, but I was also taking it to where I'm not staying. Where were we going after, after page 7504? I was, going, I, I was going to go to 7512, that's 32, where the Lord Stain says, well, um, on, the, on the facts, he wasn't satisfied that the complaining juror after the event uh, was giving an entirely accurate account. Which is paragraph 32. Thank you.
will say this case would fall within what's called the only exception. Yes. 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 So the secrecy rule is, is the prevailing rule, but uh, there can be exceptions. And that's, that's the main holding of that. I'm just looking at 749 anyway. That's what I say. So it is in theory possible. It would in theory be possible for uh, a juror after the event who's kept, or for it to be discovered after the event, that a juror has been bribed, he's kept it to himself, and for the court then to investigate. Uh, but in my submission, in those circumstances, the court would still say, even though the juror had been bribed, let us say, uh, the jury was caught. Is the um, ratio of Mirza at paragraph 94 in Lord Hope's speech, on page 7527, paragraph 94 onwards, which makes clear there is a, a prohibition? It's only where, in effect, some extraneous occurrence has occurred that means effectively the jury didn't deliberate. They yes. used a Ouija board or something of that kind. 94, 96, yes. Yeah. 95. There's no, of course, there's no doubt about the general rule. about the court, what was the jury court? My answer is yes. The next question is, was the judge bound to discharge the jury in any event because uh, the risk of uh, prejudice or bias was irremediable? Should he have said at that point, when the, um, when the complaint is made, should he have simply said, well, I can't, we can't carry on, full stop, because of the risk of prejudice uh, to the defendant. So my submission, no. Um, uh, first, there's the point I made yesterday. It cannot be the case that an accused can engineer the automatic end of, automatic, I emphasize, automatic end of the trial by his own misbehavior, tampering with the jury. And likewise, I submit that cannot be the case in the event of a juror who, let us say, he hasn't been contacted by the defendant, but for whatever reason, he is acting in the interests of the accused and offering bribes. It cannot be the case that a trial can be brought to an end so, so automatically in those circumstances. And in my submission, were there to be such a rule, this is a common law matter, but that will bring the system, the whole legal system, and the jury system into disrepute uh, and make the administration of a jury trial almost unworkable. Second, uh, on the facts. Why, why, why do you say that? Because in normal circumstances, if this came to light, that particular juror would be discharged. I agree with that. Uh, normally. So the whole system wouldn't come to a halt. Uh, in circumstances such as this, I agree with that. I'm going to be supposed to discharge the jury. But in circumstances such as this, it would, it would bring automatic. If my learned friends are right, there's an automatic. It just comes to an end, full stop. I submit that cannot be right. There is still a power in the court. As long as a fair trial can be ensured, there's still a power in the court to allow the trial to go ahead. And in my submission, the next question then is, well, did the judge, was, did, did the judge exercise, or can it be said the judge exercised his discretion wrongly and perversely in allowing the trial to go ahead? That is the correct question, focusing on the position as it was before the trial judge when uh, the problem went on. And in my submission, the trial judge, it would be wrong to interfere with the trial judge's exercise of discretion for the following reasons. First, as things stood, it was a mere allegation, no doubt one which appeared to be supported uh, by strong evidence, 
but it would not be practical at that point to carry out an investigation of the corrupt jury himself. That couldn't seriously have been done. And what is more, my lord, I might add, he, although he was found guilty of attempting to the course of justice, he did in fact plead not guilty. Uh, and one just wonders, well, what, what in real life? What benefit would that have done? How could the judge have taken matters further? He had it on the word of the poor woman that uh, the, um, uh, she had told the jurors that they weren't taking any notes of this, and in my submission, that was good enough. What was to be gained by the judge asking of each and every juror what their position was? Secondly, in my submission, the judge was entitled to take into account the view expressed by the four women that none of the ten jurors had accepted the bribe. That, that's an important point. He's entitled to take that into account and say that, well, that sounds true to me. And that she, the four women, had told the others that they must abide by their oath. It's obvious that the judge was impressed by the four women, and he would have seen her, and he will have to form a judgment as to whether she's a trustworthy person. And he's entitled in my submission to take that into account. Third, he was entitled to take into account A, his own directions so far, and I'll come to those in a moment, B, his assessment of the jurors over the 56 days of trial so far, especially this, my lord, it is evident they have acted on his repeated warnings not to talk to anyone, despite the obvious temptation of doing so in such a high-profile trial, and C, he was in fact taken into account that he could give a further direction that could be given to remedy any prejudice to the accused. Now, I'll come to that direction if I may in a moment, but just before he, he goes back in the court, he's entitled to say to himself uh, there is, that it is proper for me to carry on with this trial because I can ensure that a fair trial will happen, bearing in mind everything that's happened in the case. Thirdly, I emphasise this point, the Court of Appeal, who have a good knowledge of the local circumstances, upheld the way the judge dealt with that. And that you see at E5869, paragraphs, E5869, my lord, yes, 5869, paragraphs 237 to 238. And then also 240 to 241. In the paragraph, the second sentence of page 5869, yes. that approach, um, on the face of it, looks somewhat problematic. I would suggest that we don't want to investigate much further because the likelihood is we're going to have to discharge the jury. Well, my lord, uh, uh, one has to see that in context. He's saying uh, there was nothing that had been gained and a great deal that would be lost the possibility then to discharge it by questioning the accused juror. So it's, it's not just saying, uh, the court of appeal saying, what was to be gained by questioning the accused jury? And in my submission, that was a perfectly proper uh, um, approach. I mean, one does ask, what was to be gained? By but it's an acknowledgement that that juror was not going to abide by his oath, well, isn't it? Oath, uh, 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 well, it's an acknowledgement that he may well be, may well not abide by his oath. That is right. My, my, I can't deny that there was obviously a risk, bearing in mind... Well, more than a risk, it was... A likelihood, maybe. Um, so far as one could tell, one, one only has an allegation. But, but, but I come back to the point I made yesterday. Well, if it was just a risk, then he would have investigated and impressed upon the juror the importance of... 
not being affected by I, I extraneous can, yes. considerations. I can see that. Uh, but even if one allows that, um, you have my suspicion yesterday, if the risk is just that one, or probability that just that one juror is not going to perform his duty, that in my submission is not a reason for discharging the entire jury. If the prosecution who are affected by that bias says, carry on anyway. And that, that you might say, is um, a pragmatic point, but in my submission, that is a perfectly proper approach for the court to take. If, if it is, I mean, it wouldn't be right the other way around. If there was a juror who was biased against the defence, that might all be very different indeed. But here, we are talking about the state who is bringing the charge in the public interest, who knows there is a problem with one juror. Because one juror is bent against the prosecution. Come on, May. Let's just assume that the real problem between which we're facing is, is, is that, that, that there was a risk that, that the whole of the rest of the jury were biased against the defense. My Lord, I, I accept that, 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 that that's a different risk, if I may, for the moment. That, that is a different risk. But just as far as questioning the individual bad juror, my Lord, and that was the point which this particular paragraph is on, I submit that, that there was nothing to be gained. There was indeed. What's he going to do? He's just going to deny it, probably. Yes, but this is really the point I think that Lord Burroughs is making, that if you read on, they're saying a great deal would have been lost by questioning the accused juror. Uh, and what would have been lost was, would, have, well, would have been the trial, because the, um, if, the, if the accused juror had admitted the conduct alleged, then not only he, but the entire jury uh, would have had to be discharged. Well, um, my lord, uh, uh, I submit he wouldn't necessarily have discharged the jury, e the jury even if, let's say, the individual juror had said, oh, I own up. But if his thinking is, and I submit it was, likely to have been this, I've got one bad juror here, I, I, I've got good reasons to suppose the other ten will behave properly. That means there will be, a, the, the, the jury will be quarried at eleven. In my submission, he is entitled, as a, he is not bound to say, I've got to stop the trial now. He has a power to allow the trial to go ahead. That is, and I also accept that as a kernel of my submission. And it has to be one which he exercises not entirely unreasonably in all the circumstances of the case. That is why I'm making the submissions I have been. If you were the case, that the same rules applied in Jamaica as applied in England and Wales, that is, you could have had a jury of ten. Mm. What would you then say? <laughs> I think I'd be bound to accept that the judge would have said, let's go down to ten. He probably would, in those circumstances, have said, balance. So the problem that you're faced is a system that doesn't allow a jury of ten. That's exactly the problem. At the whole so problem. an unfair trial that might be put against you is allowed because the rules don't allow a jury to go around to ten. Is that right? No, I, I'm not saying that. I'm uh, far from saying that. As long as the trial is fair, overall, I'm gonna, I haven't come to my point about the fairness of the trial, but as long as the judge is satisfied that a fair verdict can be returned, even though one juror appears to be bent on assisting the defence, the judge can say, I, the, of the lesser of two evils is the trial goes ahead, the administration of justice is served by the trial going ahead, and there is no common law rule that requires me to stop the trial. And is, yeah, sorry, but the, 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 um, the corrupt juror might be critical, his vote might be critical to whether there was a majority or not. It might be, um, but in those circumstances, that is a risk that the prosecution well, well, that's, that's the point. Uh, yeah. you see, that's the point I'm jibbing at, really. Yes. The idea that responsibility for the administration of justice in the public interest is the responsibility of, a, of the prosecutor and can effectively be waived, if you like, by the prosecutor, rather than being the responsibility of the court. Yes, I do accept that, but my lord, it is still the responsibility of the court. If the court is satisfied... Well, but, but you see the problem, that if, I mean, it does, if, if, you're, if, it, if you're presiding in a criminal trial where a majority verdict can be returned and you know that one of the members of the jury, or you have good, um, good reason to suspect that one of the yeah. members of the jury may be um, uh, corrupt, um, 
for all you know, um, his, the way he votes in the jury room could be critical to the verdict that's returned and could return, could, could return a, could result in a wrongful acquittal, for example. Well, uh, uh, well uh, my lord, again, I, I come back to my point. Yeah, that it, 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 the judge is entitled to weigh, the judge is entitled to weigh up all the different evils. I mean, the real problem is that the judge was caught between two evil solutions. Yes, oh, oh, I like that. <laughs> yes, I, I, I have the greatest sympathy for the judge. And I, I mean, in this country, we would think twice about rerunning a 67-day trial. But in a country like Jamaica, the defense involved in this part of anything else is, is, is enormous. But my lord, my submission is this, as long as the prosecution is acting responsibly, and as long as the judge is acting responsibly and reasonably, rationally, in making these decisions, and as long as they are satisfied that overall, there can be, not necessarily that there will be, but there can be a fair verdict, if there can be, then in my submission, the lesser of two evils is to go ahead and get that fair verdict, rather than simply say, trial off, no verdict, which in real life may well mean, may, no trial whatsoever. I, uh, that, and that is why I say one must look, it's not just a matter of sympathy for the judge, it's what is the responsible, forgive my putting it this way, the responsible response to this very, very difficult situation. Which is the lesser of two evils? And my submission is the lesser is to go ahead in the hope that there can be a fair verdict. You may well land up with an unfair acquittal. That is one risk you take. But it is better to take the chance of getting a fair verdict than to abandon that altogether. A fair verdict would be reached in circumstances where the allegedly corrupt juror would not only have a vote, but he'd have the opportunity to influence the other members of the jury. But he, would, he, might, he might still receive to influence the other members of the jury, but he would Sorry? In deliberation. In deliberation. He, still, he can still say what he likes in deliberation. He can still draw attention to a good point, let us say. Um, uh, that can still happen. He's not prevented from doing so. Um, he may well be able to persuade one of the other jurors, not by offering money. <laughs> No, by it. offering money. No, 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 no. He, but he may. No, he may. He may be able to persuade one of the other jurors in deliberation. Look, forget about my bribe. The, these people are innocent because of point X. He's still entitled to do that. Well, he's uh, entitled to do that, but he's not entitled to persuade them by offering them bribes. So that not. is, that is an ongoing risk. That is my. I, mean, I accept that is an ongoing risk. Yeah. That, that must be right as a risk. You will try again. Yeah. I mean, you might think it's a bit unlikely for that to be reported to the judge, actually. But there's a possible risk. Let us say there's a possible risk. My, my lady, even in those circumstances, if that is a risk which the prosecution is prepared to take in order to achieve a fair, a verdict, that is the lesser of two evils, and if the, both the judge and the prosecution think that is a proper way of proceeding, they can. That is my fundamental point. And one of the problems with jury trials is uh, one is trying to create uh, a persistent of a perfection. In one sense, of course, this is not perfect. No one would begin to say it's perfect, but is it, in fact, the pragmatic way forward, which did, in the event, secure a fair verdict? That is but, the, but the defendant's counsel did, didn't accede to this way of proceeding. That they continued to raise object. Well, on the face of it, it looks as if they were objecting. They did. They did. There's no doubt about that. But they were objecting for different. They weren't objecting on the core point. But they were objecting because the, the way it's put, I think, by one of them is the overcompensation point. I'm yes. concerned about it. Yes. And that's a fair point. Yes. And I'm not saying it's a bad point. But in my submission, it's not a conclusive point. The judge is entitled to say, well, um, uh, I, I'm still prepared to put this matter to the jury because of the various points I'm going to come to later because the strength of the case, um, I've been assured that I will give another direction. I have already given directions about not being persuaded by extraneous matters. The judge in my submission, and this is in a sense the heart of the case, was he bound to stop it? My answer is no, he was not bound to stop it for the reasons I've given.
and I do submit, I take my Lord's point about the Court of Appeal's judgment, but I do submit this is important to bear in mind what the Court of Appeal had to say about this matter. They have, they have familiarity with how juries work, how the system works, and it's their primary responsibility to ensure the criminal system works properly. You are operating as a second review court. This is a point to me that made again and again. And I do submit great respect is entitled, uh, it should be given to the Court of Appeal's assessment on this point. Oh, it will be. <laughs> but uh, 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 so, my lord, you have my point on that. Um, can I? Um, uh, so, I say there was no uh, error of law in what the judge did. That's what it boils down to. He acted within his discretion. It was not an unreasonable decision to make, given the extremely difficult circumstances in which he found himself, and the possibility that they could still get their verdict. That's the point. My Lord, can I just turn to the judge's directions? But it's important that it ties in with the previous point. I've already given you references to some directions before. Can I also ask you to go, please, to E4723, the four, which is what he says to the jury right at the beginning, which is a resounding direction in my submission. E4723. 4723. 4723. 4723. This is right at the start, is it? Yes, right at the start. It's right at the summing up. Start at the summing up, yes. And it continues to 4724. This was. At this stage, by the judge in ignorance of the Yes. I don't first read that, but you can just read those two pages, continuing to the top of 4725. Can you remind me how long the summing up lasted? 
it begins on the 6th of March. You can see that at 4722. It ends on the 13th. Yes, I think there are breaks. I have a feeling it may have been three days altogether, but I will be corrected if it's four days. I think there may have been. Um, uh, uh, anyway, we, we know the gap is uh, uh, the gap is out on the sixth of March to the thirteenth. I think so. Um, which is perhaps the more important point. Yeah. But in my submission, they won't have forgotten all this. Um, can I also, while I'm on this point, at four seven three eight, a little bit further on, is the point about prejudice. And this, he, um, 4738 to 4741, he goes on about prejudice, ignore all prejudice, just look at the evidence, don't speculate. And it goes on to 4741, um, in 4741, halfway down the page. I can just ask you again to read that yourselves. Specific 
allegation made, and all he's done is to repeat what he said to the jury at the start of the trial. Well, and, well without adding quite a bit of the stuff he did say at the start of the trial, uh, as summing up, um, that is true. I, will, I, I fully accept it is not targeted. The question is overall, the overall question is, did the jury, but is there a real risk the jury was influenced? against the appellants. I submit no. They've got the message from the judge loud and clear all the way through. Do we see anything in either of the judges' appraisal of the problem or in the Court of Appeals' appraisal of the problem of a real weighing of the risk of what I think counsel for the defendants at the time called overcompensation? I.e. the risk that the cost of the widespread attempt to bribe the jury and then the defendants must be guilty. Uh, well, I, I, I think it's fair to say that there is no. Um, well, the, the judge himself, obviously, he, he, he doesn't think it because he doesn't have a decision. Yes, no, he doesn't. No. He just goes ahead. It's a fairly short. The trouble is, it's all built with very quickly. It's a short seem to address the their minds to that issue. Not quite clear to what extent that was you know, One of the problems is in the Court of Appeal, as far as one can tell, that doesn't really appear to be the main thrust of the appeal. The, the thrust of the appeal was more investigation should be made by the judge. And the bias point it, it was, it was there, but it wasn't, so to speak, um, centre stage. That's my understanding. And so that, no doubt, is why the matter doesn't receive the attention which now has been subjected to. Um, but, but my lord, the question, the next question is, if I may, was there a real risk that the trial was unfair? I submit that is the ultimate question. That is say unfair by reason of subconscious prejudice, or conscious prejudice against the accused because of the bribes that have been offered apparently in their interest. I say there is no real risk that the ten jurors who voted to convict were influenced to do so by their knowledge that bribes have been offered by the miscreant juror. And first of all, can I just make this point? I submit it is more accurate to describe the question as one of prejudice than as one of bias. The reason I say that is this. Bias generally, in general language, arises as a result of an internal disposition which affects a person's whole way of thinking about a case or about a matter. And this, in my submission, is a heightened, and therefore there's a heightened risk that a juror won't comply with his oath. Supposing I'm a, an absolute outgoing, out and out racist, and I believe all, um, all black people are, are useless or bad, I don't, you're never going to get rid of that. The problem is you're very likely, maybe it's just me, it's part of me. Well, let us say I'm a Chelsea fan and I'm a referee in the Chelsea game. I'm just going to give all those split decisions to Chelsea and so forth. It's just in me. I can't help it. That's, in my submission, bias, which is irremediable. But there's, at the other end of the spectrum, there's prejudice, which arises as a result of a potential prejudice, which arises in the mind of a neutral person, uh, neutral jurors, which comes about as a result of an external event, such as here. And what could be, let us say, let's say in the course of a trial, knowledge of bad character comes out. It's that sort of, that's the real analogy we have in this case. The jurors have found out something which could weigh against the, which could cause them to weigh or take things into account against the accused and make him think that he is guilty when otherwise they would not have come to that conclusion. And in my submission, it's that type of case we're dealing with. Is, was what happened something which is likely or there's a risk that would cause them to come to a conclusion they would not otherwise have come? But does it make a difference whether it's bias or prejudice? It may not, it may not, but I uh, the reason what I, difference it does make at the moment. But there, is, there are some types of prejudice which are more deep, if I can put it this way, it, it, it is insidious, and that would be racial bias. Then, for instance, I'm a neutral person and I've come to find out something in the course of a trial, and it will be easier in my submission for me to forget and the court can more easily assume that the jury will comply with that oath. So do we come back to Lord Bingham, which is Lord Justice Bingham's president was passed in London? Well, yes, there's a real risk that, not on this occasion, a single juror, but all of the jurors, or one of them, might, as a result of the approach, consciously or unconsciously, have become prejudiced yes. for or against yes. one or more of the defendants. Yes. 
that I accept that as the test. And that's in fact where it's put those prejudices from bias. Um, uh, and my Lord, my Lord, I accept that is the test. But as against that, you have to start from the premise that jurors, you can trust jurors not to be prejudiced and to follow their oath. I've given you the reference that they followed. Um, I won't take you now because I'm conscious of time, but also at this point, a similar point arose in the case of Morrison, which you can see at E7560, uh, in particular, uh, paragraph 19, uh, we refer to this in our case, and then 7565, paragraphs 40 to 41, uh, 42 and 44 to 45. So it's 7565, seven, uh, 40, I think putting it more simply, 40 to 45. And that was the case where, again, the Court of Appeal said, well, you, you, you must trust the jury to perform their oath in accordance with their duty. It's a fundamental tenet. Uh, no. Mr. Knox, I should, I should let you know that we've now received the correct version of the Jury Act, um, and uh, the version of uh, Section 31 that was enforced then is much simpler, and I think it all, it all makes sense. Oh, I'm sorry it didn't make sense. <laughs> it's quite makes sense. It's actually rather easier to make sense of it. Um, but I'm grateful, I haven't yet seen it, but... Um, my Lord, I'm conscious of time. Can I just um, uh, I move on to my next point? The first point I'm making is you can trust the jurors. This was a question of prejudice, external prejudice. You can trust the jurors to obey their oath. Well, on a year while go on some peeps. Prosecutor, they have a hard time right now. To try to prove to the, the, the judge them say why the jury. We 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 want to, we're not gonna take the bribe. I will try to bribe the next one. Them have a right to continue in the trial till the trial done. Because cartel lawyer them, the defense lawyer said no. Them should have just cancel out all of them jury there. So I, the big debate are going both right there. So now, seeing but this is part day two, seeing part one of day two. We are forward later with. Day 2, part 2. Saying, this is the Yardman Second Chance channel. And we're out. Bless.